Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to welcome all of you to our online seminar. I'm Sabir Lallen, founder and CEO of Sibons. As you may know, Sibons is a data provider. We provide data on financial markets with the main focus on bond market. And also Sibons is a conference house. We've started this activity with online seminars from the beginning of pandemic from April this year, when we felt uh, a need from our client for such a format. At that time, markets were extremely turbulent with bond yields uh, uh, go going up sharply and bond prices going down sharply and investors looked around, what should I do in the middle of this nightmare? Since that, uh, things have changed rapidly and now it's totally different and we see that in many markets the yields are on the historically low levels, uh, which means uh, from the one hand that uh, investors uh, have uh, have very nice historical returns, but they have to reinvest in less and less and less uh, yielding bonds. Uh, obviously, it creates more demand for risky assets, including emerging market bonds. Uh, when government bonds are in many countries and developed countries are uh, in a negative yield area, of course, investors uh, tend to explore other opportunities, including again uh, emerging markets. And uh, for today's event, we've decided to make it region specific so we will not focus on global markets we will focus on markets middle east and asia and uh, we have two prominent experts uh, who are to join us today uh, the one is mr shri ruga narayan ka he is ceo of a company called financial benchmarks which is a company providing benchmark calculation for uh, bond market and for money market in India. And uh, our second expert is Stanley Tsai from Penyan Credit Rating from Hong Kong. It's a rating agency covering uh, bond market in China and, uh, and Asia. And then we will have a short presentation from my colleague, uh, Srivijay Kakirde, who will show how you can use the bonds uh, as an investor to uh, look at bond data, to make bond choice, to compare bonds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so let's start, and I will now pass the floor to Srivijay Kakirde, who will be moderating our seminar today. And very nice feature of online seminars is that you can easily put your questions to our experts. So there is a chat uh, that you may see. So just type your questions there and we will do our best to, to ask our experts to, to answer all of your questions. Uh, so thank you for your attention and now I will pass the floor to my colleague Srivijay Katirne. Good morning and good day everyone. Thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, so as Sergey already mentioned, uh, I'll give, give you a brief agenda of uh, what we are having today. Uh, so first uh, speaker is Mr. Uh, Rudra Narankar. He'll be giving us an overview of uh, India microeconomics. Uh, he has uh, 33 years uh, served uh, for I RBI in uh, various regulation uh, capacities as uh, uh, supervision and market clusters. He retired in 2017 and joined uh, Financial Benchmarks India as a CEO. He has experience in uh, Forex reserve management, capital management. He's involved in uh, committees and work groups set up by RBI and SEBI. Uh, he has chaired, chaired work group of uh, CDS. He has served nominee director uh, of banks of uh, Bank of Hyderabad and Syndicate Bank. Uh, so I request now uh, Mr. Rudra Kar to join in uh, and uh, give us a brief uh, overview of the India microeconomics. Thank you. Uh, 
good morning everybody ladies and gentlemen can you hear me yes yes can yeah uh, greeting greetings from mumbai so the is a background the covid 19 possibly is at its uh, peak and uh, the numbers are regularly continuously rising so uh, i would give a brief overview of uh, the macro economic indicators or uh, since the topic is only for 10 minutes i'll give an overview of the indicators and uh, draw some inferences with regard to the, uh, the extreme situation which we are passing through if you look at the real gdp growth between 1819 and 1920 it has uh, substantially decelerated and uh, per capita real gdp growth also has moved downwards from 5.1% in 1819 to 3.1% in 1920 export growth has decelerated from 12.3% in 1819 to a negative territory of minus 3.6% import growth has decelerated more from 8.6% to minus 6.8% the cpi the all, the all india consumer price index which the reserve bank of india targets as its monetary policy for its monetary policy plan has been also in the decline from march 20 at 5.84 to march 2019 at 2.86 inflation wholesale price index has moved down from 4.3% to 1.7% coming to the, the the fiscal situation in india the government of india's fiscal deficit has uh, you know gone up a little bit from 3.4% in 1819 to 3.8% in 1920 and if you combine with the states uh, borrowing or a state's fiscal deficit so obviously it has moved upward from 5.7% to 5.9% this has happened because during this period uh, there has been a moderation or acceleration in the economic activities and forcing the government to spend more or expand its activities more so now this slide would give you a feel of the the, the growth of different industries in the indian economy which contributes majorly to the to its gdp the major sector where the drastic shortfall has been seen is basically mining which has gone from minus 5.8 gone down in 18 sorry gone down at minus 5.8% it has shown some growth of 3.1% but other than mining and and agriculture of course agriculture last year there is a good monsoon and this year we are also predicting a, a good monsoon so we pin our hopes on a good agriculture harvest this year too rest of the parameters are not uh, looking as good as you would uh, presume we yeah. are uh, this i will uh, skip i will only talk about the gross fixed capital formation or as a percentage of gdp in 2020 it has sharply fallen from 31.9% to 21.8% this year uh external sector i have talked about the decline in in, in exports and decline in, in imports obviously this has uh, the any impact on the current account balance the current account balance has uh, it was you know, at minus 57.3 billion in 1819 and it has come down to minus 24.7 billion it is with you know, uh, obviously with the deceleration in the economic activity the current account balance has improved and in 2021 in the first quarter you have a current account surplus of 0.5 billion although india is generally a current account deficit country in terms of capital account capital account has seen a hefty growth good growth from 53.9 billion in in 1819 to 84.2 billion in uh, 1920 in case of fdi fdi has also seen good 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 growth and foreign exchange reserve has commensurately uh, grown between 1819 to 1920 as on july 3 the the the, the, the reserve stood at 513 billion 0.25 billion us dollar coming i i'll make some observations about the real economy 
the growth actually slowed down during the period of uh, you know 1920 not before the uh, covid 19 but yes the after the covid 19 pandemic uh, it has uh, ocean this is known as ocean manufacturing sector experienced a massive decline but agricultural sector and as i explained and government sector these are the two areas of growth main source of growth construction which is generally labor intensive in india has suffered badly and possibly conti- and continues to bleed the main driver of growth was consumption in expenditures external sector balance as i have shown earlier has improved because of huge improvement in current account balance and of course 33 jump percent jump in the fdi flow coming to the indian economy financial sector yeah i would just like to indicate the the status of bank credit while the bank credit in the government continues at uh, 11.8 it said 11.8 percent or bank credit to the commercial to, to sector which is the you know the which 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 uh, moves the wheel of the economy is a uh, growth is only at 6.3 percent and grow growth of bank credit to the micro and small industries 1.7 percent to medium industries is minus 0.7 percent and to large industries only 0.6 percent it shows that the growth of the credit has not been very robust uh, so the next slide it says bank credit moderation across all bank groups the one indicator of the soundness of the banks is the capital to risk weighted assets ratio crai in september it was at 15% in march it is 14.8% in march 2020 and it has seen slight improvement from march 2020 the gross gnp the gross non performing assets of the banking system it has uh, shown improvement from 9.3% in september to march 2020 at 8.5% provision coverage ratio also have, has uh, improved an improvement in asset quality and uh, no, no profitability coming to the rbi policy stance the fact that, that there is a moderation in the economy although the inflation has risen in the in, in some parts of 1920 the uh, there has been a continuous accommodative monetary policy stance by the reserve bank of india in april the policy repo rate the, which is the lending rate of the reserve bank to the uh, banking system was at 6% and it fell to 5.15% by uh, august 2019 which is almost 60 basis point lower and then to 5.15 in october since then keeping in view the inflation uh, target it i think continued its policy stance till february and after february 2020 when the pandemic when the ramifications of the of the covid 19 pandemic unfolded rbi went into the monetary policy action and it reduced its policy st- rate from 5.15 in february to 4% in in may 2020 which is roughly 115 basis point lower and these two rates were reduced in a, not in the monetary, usual monetary policy system policy metric made outside the scheduled policy metric this basically shows the uh, the law for reverse law the policy repo rate the policy repo rate and the movement of the weighted average call rate this is an indicator how the money market has moved um it has been uh, generally stable and it has moved in sync with the monetary policy rate uh ten year g sec which was around 7.3% sometimes in uh, the april 2019 has moved to, to almost um, almost to 5.80% uh, maybe in the uh, previous study okay this uh, moment in exchange rate you can see this obviously the exchange uh, the, the exchange rate of rupee against the uh, us dollar has depreciated during this period uh, and possibly i would say in line with other emerging market uh, economies the foreign portfolio investment flow which generally used to be very robust for india it has um, decelerated during the period um, of uh, last 6 uh, months yeah now i would uh, summarize it so 
macroeconomic impact of the pandemic is turning to be more severe than initially anticipated. This is basically the MPC stance you know, of May, 20, the MPC Monetary Policy Committee stance of RBI on May 22 May. The demand and supply side disruptions are very evident, diminished consumer confidence. So as of now, no growth estimate by RBI or by the government of India. IMF June 20 World Economic Outlook Forecast, it says for FY21, the economy may shrink uh, by 4.5%. Uh, and I think Eddie also has projected a negative, uh, you know, he, he has given a negative growth projection. On yesterday, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India was speaking somewhere else in some forum. And they are, they are, he has indicated, indicated that the, that the GDP growth may be in the negative territory. Although he has not quantified what would be the rate of growth, like rate of growth, but he has hinted that the, that the rate may be in the negative territory. Yeah, to fight the, the COVID-19 impact, the government and Reserve Bank has initiated measures. Reserve Bank initiated money, money, monetary measures like introducing long-term repo, targeted long-term repo, of liquidity injection by open market operations and sectoral open market operations, which is roughly 4.5% of the country's GDP. The government of India also, government of India also has supported with, with package, which is uh, maybe equivalent to 10% of the country's uh, GDP. And the, the, uh, the, the measures are in the, by way of sovereign guarantee for credit, direct fiscal expenditures, and long-term structural policy reforms. The target area have been rural employment, infrastructure, support to medium, small, marginal enterprises, MSMEs, enabling business environment, and relief package for vulnerable section of the society. Yeah, so this is the last of my presentation. As I said, so that, 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 that there is a problem, uh, problem the country is tackling and the end of COVID-19 pandemic is not yet in sight. The government and RBI are continuously on guard, looking at what more can be done to stabilize the economy. Certain exports have said that there are certain green source showing up, but it needs to be buttressed and, and sustained on a long-term basis. But the banking system is uh, possibly is, is possibly resilient. Uh, of course, it would all depend on what kind of future NPSMR once this moratorium period is, uh, is is over, and um, what kind of um, stimulus package or what kind of further initiative is in, is is initiated by the government of India to stabilize the economy. Thank you very much. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Carr, uh, for a brief overview. Uh, dear participants, uh, attendees, if you have any questions to Mr. Carr, uh, this is the right time. Uh, we'll wait for a minute because uh, you, you, this is the chance to get answers to your questions which you have. Uh, so I, I guess it was a very good presentation because we had, uh, you gave us an idea on the sector-wise uh, sector-wise growth as well as the uh, post-COVID aftermath, what would happen. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess I, we don't have any questions, so uh, so we'll move ahead with the next uh, session with uh, Mr. Stanley. Thank you very much again, Mr. Carr. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, for allowing me to speak on your online uh, seminar. Looking forward to interacting with you again. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So uh, now we will move to the uh, next session of our seminar that is uh, uh, will be presented by uh, speaker Mr. Stanley Sai. He is uh, MD of uh, Financial Institution Rating at uh, Finian Credit Rating. He has 15 years of experience as a financial analyst. He's responsible for covering financial institution sector, banks, asset manager at uh, Finian International. Uh, Stanley started his career uh, as director of uh, insurance research at Fitch Ratings. Uh, he uh, was involved in uh, IPO of AIA and China Reassurance Corporation, 
of 20 and 2 billion USD respectively. He has advised uh, more than 200 long uh, only hedge funds. So I request uh, Stanley to join in and take the floor and give us a brief on uh, a credit profile of uh, banking sector post uh, COVID-19. Well, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction and thank you uh, Ruja for the fantastic presentation on India. Um, so so it, it, it's been a challenging environment, as, as you all know. Um, and one question that we get asked a lot is, uh, with interest rates so low or even negative, uh, where do we find yield? Um, one obvious destination is China. Uh, so we've been seeing 20, 30 billion US dollars of inflows into the onshore bond market in the last few months. Uh, the problem, though, as we see it is, um, the, the money's been going into mainly sovereign bonds or um, the policy banks' bonds. Um, the, the reason perhaps may be um, do, do, do international investors not understand Chinese credits or is there something else? Um, and today I, I think um, what we want to do is to answer that question uh, as far as uh, Okay, if you don't want to invest in the corporate credits, what about the negotiated certificates of deposits of the banks? What about the subordinated debt of the banks? What about the 81? So today, uh, we hope to be able to answer that question. So if you look at this chart, right? So on the x-axis, we have um, five-year average return on equity. On the y-axis, we have the five-year average uh, CET1 ratio. So where you would want to be is uh, at the upper right corner. So, so what, what I think this chart is intended to show is um, basically the trade-off between shareholders and bondholders. Uh, on the one hand, uh, management would like to maximize their return on equity. On the other hand, they want to uh, be able to pay their creditors. Uh, as well. So um, if you look at the more sophisticated financial institutions in the world, um, they're really not looking to maximize their credit ratings. They're looking to optimize their credit ratings. So basically, I think this chart, uh, what it shows is uh, how management thinks about the trade-off between shareholders and bondholder interests. And if you look at this chart, right, uh, for those of you who follow um, financial institutions globally, you would think maybe at the upper right-hand corner, maybe it's a JP Morgan, maybe it's a Citibank, um, but then it's not. So basically, these are the six uh, biggest um, government-owned uh, banks in China. Um, so at the upper right-hand corner, you've got China Construction Bank, uh, which on average over the past five years have been making a 15% return on equity, which I think is more than enough to cover their uh, cost of equity. And the CET1 ratio has been about 13%, which is comfortably above uh, what they have to keep, uh, even as a global systemically important uh, financial institution. Um, at the bottom, you've got Postal Savings Bank, which has been making, you know, in the in the lower teens, nine uh, percent CET one. It's not bad, right? But if you look at the other group of uh, banks in China, so these are what they call the joint stock banks. Uh, so these are technically not the nationally owned banks. Um, and if you look at the X axis. You've got China Merchants Bank. So you've got a, a bank that's been making 16, 17% return on equity consistently over the last five years, or even the last 10 years or 15 years for, uh, for that matter. And they've been uh, maintaining a, a CET1 ratio in between 11, 12%, which is not bad. But what about, what about the other banks globally, right? So, so there you've got JP Morgan that's been doing ROEs of between 10 to 15% in the last five years, CET1 above 
not bad. But look at what the stock prices have done, right? Um, and you look at City and HSBC, right? They've been doing about five percent, which is not nearly enough, I think, to cover the cost of equity. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, they've been struggling. And I think one of the lessons that we learned from this chart is that the American banks have done a lot better uh, than the European banks since the financial crisis for various reasons. For example, if you look at Deutsche, so you've got this bank which is doing negative 5% ROE uh, consistently, right? Um, and that just goes on to show you how how, how difficult uh, the environment it is uh, compared to what we are seeing in in Asia, and one of the things that we we look at very intensely as a credit rating agency is um, how important these banks are uh, on a system uh, systemic basis, right? So if you look at this this table, um, the FSB publishes a, a list of all the global systemically important banks on a, a on an annual basis. So every November, uh, they publish this list, um, and the the four largest banks in China are basically the four largest banks in the whole world: uh, ICBC, Bank of China, CCB, ABC. And although the asset size uh, may be a lot bigger than a JP Morgan or HSBC or Citigroup, um, they they are not nearly as complex as uh, these international institutions. Um, and, and the way we look at uh, the, the support that governments give to these institutions is basically in line with what Basel III says, right? So you look at the size, uh, which is based on the assets. You look at the interconnectedness, which is based on their uh, interbank uh, balances. You look at how complex they are in terms of uh, what assets they hold. And then you look at uh, the substitutability, uh, which is basically the trustee custodian roles that they play, right? And that, I think, uh, matters a lot to fixed income investors in, in, the, uh, in the FI uh, space because support matters a lot um, in, in this particular sector. And the next chart basically shows um, where are we now in terms of bankruptcies, um, ba bank bankruptcies in the whole world. So if you if you look at the U.S., right? So we've seen two bank failures uh, since uh, COVID nineteen. Um, and obviously, if you look at this chart, it, it's skewed towards the financial crisis. So in 2008, 2009, you had the uh, Lehman Brothers, you had the Bear Stearns. Um, but then consistently, we've been seeing like, bankruptcies in, in, in the range of like five to 10 uh, banks a year. Um, and in China so far, we've seen three. Um, so that's just to put things into context. Now, uh, the three banks, uh, the two banks that have failed in the U.S. are relatively small, right? So one of them is the First State Bank, which has uh, 152 million U.S. dollars in assets. The other one is Ericsson State Bank, which has uh, about 95 million U.S. dollars in assets. So these are relatively small banks, but does that mean that we are not concerned about the U.S. banking industry? Uh, of course not. We are very worried. Uh, commercial mortgages, we think at least uh, 1.5 trillion US dollars are in default. Uh, we are worried about residential mortgages. We are worried about credit cards. We are worried about student loans. Um, and I think there's also, with the United States, there's also a political dimension to it. Um, so what happens um, after the elections this year? Will matter a lot to what um, to to how the banks will perform um, credit wise. Now, Europe is a little bit different. Um, they, they have been struggling, like I said before, um, b well before COVID nineteen. So, after the financial crisis, they had never really recovered to the profitability levels that they they were running at before uh, two thousand and eight. Um, and, and fundamentally, you have to realize the European economy has a much stronger reliance on banks um, than in the U.S. Two-thirds of European companies get their credit in the form of bank loans. 
uh, whereas uh, with the American firms, they get uh, less than one third directly from the banks and the rest are basically bonds and uh, equities. And um, also, like I said at the beginning, um, the negative interest rate or the low interest rate environment is a major, major risk to even the largest banks. Because when you're running at the risk-free rate, 0% or negative 0.1%, how do you make a margin on your loans, right? So uh, we, we are running the risk that uh, we, we're going to looking we're going to be looking at a, a Japanese bank type of scenario if um, if they don't recover uh, in the next two three years. And, and I think ultimately uh, the, the last point that I would like to make uh, for Europe is um, that there, there there's likely going to be consolidation. Um, are we going to see uh, mega M and A's? Perhaps. Uh, but then on a national basis, in Germany, for example, or in Spain, for example, we're going to see a lot more M&As going forward. So what about in China? So, so, so this chart shows uh, it's something that uh, we've done and, and it's something that we're going to continue to do. It's what we call the S-risk model. It's basically an equity market implied view of what the potential capital shortfall is going to be for the Chinese banks. Um, and when we last uh, updated it, um, it's at about 5 trillion RMB. So basically, if your stock trades at below book value, what the market is telling you is, I don't believe uh, what's on your book, right? Uh, you can work out the um, forward-looking net interest margin. You can look at the forward-looking cost-income ratio. Uh, what's left, basically, after the pre-provision profit is basically your non-performing loans. And what the market, at least the equity market, is telling us, they are very concerned about um, non-performing loans in China. And what does that mean in terms of percentages? So what, what 5 trillion uh, for, for the banks in our sample basically means um, the MPLs are closer to 10% than... 1.8 percent that they are reporting so there's a huge gap between what they're reporting now and what the market believes and, and where do we think the the risks uh lie right so if you look at the chinese um financial system so at the very top you've got the uh, large commercial banks meaning uh, ICBC, CCB, ABC, BOC, plus um, the Postal Bank and Bank of Communications. Uh, and then you've got about 15 joint stock banks, and you've got the policy banks, you've got the rural commercial banks, and then you've got the city commercial banks. So so where we think the, the risks lie, and, and I think um, since the onset of COVID-19, uh, we've done extensive research across uh, all the corporate sectors that we cover. And the consistent message that I've been getting is there's going to be a diversion of credit risks. Um, and it, I think it's going to be the same for the financial sector as well. So the bigger banks are going to get better. The smaller banks are going to get weaker. And it's going to happen for the next two or three years. And um, one other thing I want to mention in this chart, if you look at the gray shaded area, the trust company AUM and the bank of balance sheet WMPs. So, so these are basically, these basically form what we would call the shadow banking system. So shadow banking in and of itself is not a, necessarily a bad thing, right? So who invented shadow banking? The U.S. did. So it's the structured finance stuff that they're doing still right now, right? So what worries us? Um, with the Chinese market is not necessarily because it's off the books of the banks, but it's because it's because of the lack of regulations or uh, because of the fact that the assets themselves, right, underlying these uh, wealth management products are not necessarily funding the real economy. Um, if they are essentially a leveraged investment vehicle back into the capital markets, um, then we would get worried. So what, ha what what's going on now, right? So so the, the Chinese regulators uh, realized this um, four or five years ago. So after the massive Chinese version of QE in 2008, um, the banks 
the financial institutions, the trust companies, the securities company started doing these um, financial innovation type vehicles. Um, they've clamped down on this a lot. Um, I think the initial deadline is for them to be able to solve um, basically the whole problem by the end of this year. But because of COVID-19, I think that's going to be pushed back for another 12 to 24 months. Um, so so what, what are the policymakers doing to, to help the economy, right? So it's similar to uh, what Rudra said. So, so we need accommodative monetary policy. Um, are we at the point where uh, the central bank is printing money like they were uh, in 2008? We are not nearly uh, close to that. Um, but that they are keeping uh, a neutral to accommodative monetary policy, which I think it's going to help, the, uh, especially the smaller banks. So we're going to see lower lending rates. Um, this year, we've seen a lot of loan forbearances and grace periods. And it's not specific to the Chinese uh, market either. If you look at the U.S. Uh, banking sector, one of the problems that they have is they are basically flying blind into the next 12 to 18 months. With the loan forbearances, um, they don't know whether uh, the customers who are not paying, whether they cannot pay or they're taking advantage of the loan forbearance periods. So we're seeing some of that in China as well. And obviously we're going to, uh, like in India, we're going to see a policy um, orientation towards uh, small to medium enterprises, and we are going to see more somewhat relaxed policies towards the banking sector. And, and what do investors care about? Right. So number one, obviously, is what's the impact of lower lending rates or uh, lower interest rates on bank profitability? So I think this, this chart is interesting um, in the sense that if you look at uh, the end of 2010, um, early 2011, there was a spike in the uh, into market rates. Uh, and that's when we saw about two to three rural commercial banks uh, default in the interbank market. And since then, I think the central bank has been um, providing enough liquidity um, just so that even the smaller banks can uh, repay in the interbank market. Again, are you going to see a lot more liquidity? I don't think so. Um, they are very worried about asset prices still. Um, so interbank rates, I think, for the most part in the next two years are going to stay at this level. But lending rate, uh, I think, still has room to go down. So um, in the middle of 2019, um, they changed from their initial base lending rate to, uh, to, to the loan prime rate. And since then, um, they bas basically the benchmark rate has come down by about 50 basis points. And I think there's room for that to go down further, but is that going to fall below three and a half percent in the next twelve months? Um, I think the likelihood is going to be uh, fairly low. So, so that's going to affect bank profitability, obviously, right? So they're getting less from their loans, uh, but at the same time, they're competing for deposits. So overall, what's the impact on the bank's profitability? Uh, for the whole sector, I think it's going to be in the order of maybe 20, 30 basis points for the, for, for this year. So it's not uh, catastrophic, and it, it's going to be a profit and loss problem rather than a balance sheet problem. What I think is going to be a balance sheet problem, though, is uh, with the loan forbearances and uh, industry support, right? So what I've been hearing from my colleagues since um, the beginning of COVID-19 is, we, we, we think our companies, the companies that we cover are going to do okay because policymakers are going to support them, right? And I go, something's got to give. Who's providing the support, right? It's either the government or the banks. If you look at the banks, um, the, the peculiar feature about Chinese banks, I think, um, is uh, the, the, their special mention loans, right? So if you look at uh, ICBC in this chart, for example, um, their reported MPL is one and a half percent, perhaps. Um, but then the special mention loans altogether, uh, or what we would call problem loans, is about four percent. 
And if you look at the chart below that, the loan coverage ratio, which basically means how much they've, uh, how much provision they've set aside against uh, these non-performing loans, they've set up aside maybe three percent. So they're still short uh, about one percent. So that that goes back to um, our initial analysis about what what the equity market implied uh, non-performing loans is. Obviously, there are outperformers. If you look at China Merchants Bank's um, uh, bank in the middle, uh, their problem loan is just slightly about 2%, um, but their provision coverage is up to uh, 5%. Um, so, so they're more than, than covered. Uh, but overall, uh, what I would look at um, in terms of non-performing loans, because this is going to be a very tough year for bank analysts, um, you're not going to be able to see the the correct uh, non-performing loan numbers because of the loan forbearances, because of the policy support rate. But what I would look at, what what they cannot lie about, number one is the uh, overdue loans. You look at their 90-day overdue loans. The other thing is you look at the uh, special mention loan migration. So what they booked as special mention loan uh, at the end of last year, how much of that um, has actually gone into... Uh, the non-performing loan category. Uh, that that's one thing that I would look uh, very closely at. And again, it's uh, it's similar to to India and, and a lot of uh, other emerging Asian economies. We've got to support the uh, small to medium enterprises because in China they account for uh, about sixty percent of GDP, uh, but the financing that they're getting is a lot less than that. Uh, so with the current environment, they're going to uh, continue to suffer, I think. How big of a problem is that? Uh, if you look at the chart uh, at the bottom left, so what they call the micro loans. So think about them as um, companies with about 10 million RMB in revenues. So it's about a quarter of uh, the, the, the loan book of the whole sector, right? And within that, what they call inclusive finance. So companies that are even smaller than that. It's about a third of that. Um, so, so that's sort of the scale of the problem. Um, but then in terms of the amount, absolute amounts, right? So um, the, the larger uh, state-owned banks are going to take the uh, majority of the problems. But then as a percentage of the loan book, uh, it's not that big of a problem. Uh, I, I think the stress point, though, is with the perhaps the um, non-listed smaller rural commercial banks. So we're going to see a pickup in MPLs in, in that particular uh, sector. And although individually they may not be uh, important to the system, collectively um, they, they are as big as um, the larger um, joint stock banks. So finally, um, with what's been happening with the, the policy support, are regulatory reforms ongoing or are they going to be stalled, right? So, so the short answer is I think the financial reforms are still going to happen. Uh, and, and here we point to a very specific problems, right, uh, with the uh, wealth management products. Uh, we think the, the reforms are ongoing, uh, but like I said, the deadline is going to be postponed, right? So if you look at the wealth management products uh, for the whole sector uh, as a percentage of the deposit base, uh, it's come down to about um, 12%, maybe. Uh, it's going to go down further, I think, in the next two years to about the 10% level. So it's uh, it, it, it may be worrying for specific banks, but for the sector as a whole, um, I think the risks are, are still uh, within control, especially if you look at chart four um, in this slide, right? So what they call the non-standard credit, which basically means um, credit assets that have no... Uh, liquidity or, or, or market price. Uh, it's now about 17%. Um, it, it's a problem, um, but it, I, I think it's a problem that uh, we, we're going to grow out of in the next 24 months. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stanley, for a great, great presentation. 
So uh, we we now uh, I hope that attendees have an idea of the uh, what is happening in the ba banking sector and what we expect. Also, uh, we hope that the the policymakers really do their thing and support the banking sector. So as uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we we can only hope for that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it is one of the key aspects which is very important. Uh, and of course, uh, the the industry support, which is also required from banking side, and let's see how the the if if lending goes down and the interbanking rates remain on the same level. So yeah, it is a very very uh, brief and uh, like very clear picture which you have given. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if we have any questions for Stanley, you can send it to us. We will mail it to uh, Stanley and he'll be able to uh, reply on them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Stanley. Thank you. All right. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, now I will make uh brief after these two two uh, wonderful presentations i will make an an presentation on our website so now you have an understanding on what to look at uh, what are the key parameters when you invest in uh, different uh, different industries or now you have an understanding so i would like to show you uh, the platform uh, i'll share my screen now so the platform is, uh, just a second, I'll share my screen. Okay, so now, now you have an understanding of the uh, platform, how everything, I mean, of, of the ideas which which speakers have already given so we have a platform which will help you search on different parameters so there are two parts one is to search analyze then you can also track your uh, investments so this is how our platform looks like so this is a brief uh, overview landing page uh, we have different methods of getting the data from the system First thing is, of course, the uh, web page that I have opened. So website through which you can get the information. Then we have mobile app, Excel add-in. So you, Excel add-in helps you work directly into uh, Excel using the formulas which we have embedded. It just installs a tool and you can use different formulas and retrieve the data. Then also we do provide API feeds so that is we send bulk data to different uh, banks and financial institutions who use them in their internal system for their analysis and uh, give a brief you can say uh, useful interface which they already have internally and present our data so uh, the first tool which is heart of the uh, cbonds platform that is the a uh, quick search tool. So uh, this is very important tool because you can just uh, type in. So as we were discussing about uh, India and China, we can just type in India and you will see uh, the uh, different results. So right now we have more than 1,000 uh, Indian bonds. Then you can also see indices, stocks. So the quick search tool, what it does is it browses through all the information on our platform and gives you result in uh, bond sector, stock sector, as well as indices. So let's talk about uh, the bond sector. So I just wanted to show you some bond of, let's say, Adani Port. This is uh, Indian issuer. And then you can just type in USD. So you will get off a list of all the USD bonds of this particular issuer, you just click on the name of the uh, uh, bond and it will open the bond page. So here we have a bond page. I will also definitely go through uh, all the details which we have here. 
of the bond page so we have different sections and everything so i will definitely go through each section and explain how exactly it works uh in the uh, in couple of minutes another important tool is the bond search tool so this tool has more than 100 different parameters uh, which can be used to search uh, data on specific uh, specific uh, needs which you have let's say uh, you are interested in as we were uh, discussing let's say we are interested in uh, asian market so you select asia then in uh, industry as we are discussing Stanley about banking sector so let's select bank and you want to know all the bonds in us dollars so you just type usd and we can select yield let's say higher bond more than five percent of course you can put duration placement maturity then we have ratings from uh, different rating agencies so uh, let's say we can select the uh, ratings from any two of these like moody's snp fitch uh, any two of these more by investment grade let's say bbb to aaa and we do have different classifications so because some are invest uh, interested only in sukuks or they don't invest in convertible so you can include and exclude all these parameters based on requirement in issue information uh, you can they put any special purpose vehicle name if there is any created by the issuers or start put date or if suppose you want interested in specific volume you can put all these uh, parameters here so right now what i have done is here you will see all the parameters which you have selected so i have selected uh, region as asia banking sector all the outstanding uh, bonds in usd and yield more than five percent and plus i have selected uh, ratings from uh, any two of the Moody's, Moody's S&P and Fitch rating agencies uh, as investment grade. So you just cl click on search. So let's do that. And what it does, it it uh, goes through more than 350,000. So it is a very fast search engine. It has now went through more than 350,000 uh, bonds, which we have from more than 180 different countries who issue bonds and it has given a result so right now you can see we have uh, five uh, bonds which satisfy the given parameters so here you will have basic information in results uh, that is of course the country issuer the currency which we have already selected what is the coupon rate of these bonds amount then uh, uh, other information like rating so you see here rating from different agencies uh then uh, of the issuer as well as for this particular issue uh, maturity they uh, these are all uh, then call option which we have and you can see here what is the indicative price and uh, uh, what is the last updated price so these are yesterday's closing date so um, rates so you can see seaborn estimation so seaborn estimation is our own methodology to calculate prices and yield so uh, it basically you can say is a weighted average of the prices which we get from different markets participants now this is the result you can save it and export it to excel so you can work with excel uh, then another thing is you can save this query so that you don't have to uh, select different parameters all the time let's say someone is interested only in the uh, these specific bonds and he wants to search them regularly so you can just put in and uh, save let's say asia high yield save it now you will see that it will say query has been saved so you can see on the top uh, we have different queries i have different queries saved you can just click on uh, asia high yield and it will give you the same results so so this is very important so whatever results which match these parameters you will see them here uh, to 
check. So let's say you want to check information on this particular bond. You just click on it. Uh, it will take you to the uh, bond page. So this is our bond page. Now you will have it. If it is secured, you, you will have it here uh, written here, senior secured. Now this bond is junior subordinated and perpetual bond. So you have all this information. I guess we have basic information of the bond that is issue rating, issue rating, then uh, what, what is the placement date? What is the put call option? Again, you will see here price and yield as per Seaborn's estimation. We scroll down. We always have uh, we have a largest database of the uh, documentation that includes prospectors, final terms, etc. We have trading chart. So this is the price chart. Uh, you can check the yield chart. You can uh, change the period. So you can. Uh, we have embedded three month, one year, three year period. You can always change that by selecting period and putting it uh, from two. If you want to know the get the historical prices in uh, in a table format, you have to just click here and you will get all the prices. This this shows you uh, shows you the prices. Uh, now you can see that there is a limit to the field, but uh, it is not a constraint. What we can do is you can select so if you want to say this bond was issued in, um, I can, uh, we check that in 2015. So what we can do is you can select from Jan 2015 and click on export. So you will get all the historical prices exported to the Excel sheet. So which is very important that you get and then you can use it for the other calculations as well now this section has uh, stock exchanges and uh, and otc codes so here you can see uh, codes from different market participants as well as uh, from the stock exchanges you can see the we have uh, intraday code from frankfurt stock exchange here so from german stock exchanges moscow stock exchange we have intraday codes uh, so it is with 15, 20 minutes delay, uh, but it gives you a brief idea of, uh, of, of the pricing and yield, everything, all the information. Uh, then again, we have all the issue information, cash flow. So you, you, you will have what are the parameters of the uh, cash flow. So this has a coupon frequency two times a year. Uh, then we, as per date, you can see here the coupon uh, payment period, dates when the coupon uh, are scheduled, what are, if there are any early redemption terms, you will see them here. Then again, uh, other information about placement. So this section is very important because you have uh, ratings from different rating agencies again in detail. So you have the date on which this rating has been updated. Uh, we understand how important it is for our users that uh, you have uh, very quick access. So what we have done is we have put covenants in place. So what these do is you will get a snapshot of what are the covenants which are there in the prospectus itself, as well as we have linked it to directly to the paragraphs inside the prospectus. So, so you want to know uh, the paragraph with event of default, you just click on here and it will open the, the prospectus. So you don't have to scroll 300, 400 pages of prospectus. It will just take you to that specific paragraph in the, in the prospectus. Uh, then we do have bond classifications. IFRS reports. So we do have IFRS reports. We have start, recently started uh, entering the holders information, which, which was a very important thing uh, requirement from our users that they wanted to know, like which are the ETFs which hold this bond. So we have uh, started putting there with the date on which it is updated. Also the related or other uh, bonds of this particular uh, issuer are shown here. Then 
if we scroll up you can see we have different tools here so if you uh, right now let's say the price is let me check uh, so i want to calculate the price so it will automatically give you the seaborne estimation price so i want to know what would be the so if i have a for 203 let's say so what would be the yield to maturity accredited interest so you have to just put the face value and it will show you all the information like uh, yield to put uh, because this is a perpetual bond you have yield to put accredited interest all the other parameters so we have a glossary for all these parameters which you will be able to uh, see then uh, this what we have went through how to look in for a bond let's say you have some bonds which are in your portfolio or there are some bonds which you want to track and get updates so the best uh, tool is watch list so when you are there are different methods to add uh, uh, issues to the watch list one a of the methods is when you are on the bond page you have to click add to watch list uh, you can select so it will give you an option to select different uh, trading floors you can select multiple trading floors but uh, we recommend sibon estimation as i said it gives you a weighted average of the prices which we have from all these sources so it will it will give you an average price so we save it or if you want of course you can uh, again add and remove uh, the uh, the bond from watch list here so let's i'll i'll add another that is hong kong stock exchange so when i save it uh, let's go to the watch list tool so it is here watch list So now, now as we are on the watch list tool, you will see I already have uh, different uh, bonds added to my watch list. Uh, so just now we added one bond that is Bank of East Asia. So you can see we have two different parameters which have been added. So here, C bonds estimation. Then uh, we again scroll on the right hand side. So uh, the very important tool again here option is to keep track of bonds so you just click on the bell icon select price or yield so you want to track let's say i want to track when the price goes uh, below 98 so let's say when it goes below 98 and i save it so whenever the price goes below 98 percent of the face value i will receive a notifications in the mail as well as uh, there are some notifications which are stored here for 30 days so even if you miss the mail and you logged in you can always check uh, the notifications which you have missed uh, and everything here so these are all the notifications which i have received in mail plus they are here so now it is very easy to uh, to keep track of the bonds we also do have mobile app and uh, it is all synchronized with the platform so in the mobile app also you can add remove uh, the the bonds to watch list uh, it will show you the 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 price change so lots of investors then investment managers banks which use our platform what they do is in the morning they open open the mobile app and go to the watch list so they already have a, a list of bonds which they are tracking of their clients or if it is a private investor of his investments or if he is planning to invest in and just scrolls and gets an idea what is happening in the market where, where what is the trend for, for these particular bonds uh, where it is moving so uh, this is one of the uh, very important uh, tool then uh, we do store information on stocks so this is something which we have started recently this was uh, because uh, we wanted that those who invest in bonds they generally have a, 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 a uh investment in uh, stocks as well and 
and we wanted to make a platform where both the information is available. We right now have uh, information from 51 different uh, uh, stock exchanges which we are now improving so ev every month there are a lot of uh, new stock exchanges above then stocks are being added so as you can see based on different parameters you can again uh, search for for different stocks uh, we will be adding stocks to the watch list tool as well so it is uh, you can say under development then uh, we have indices so this is one of the largest uh, database of indices as well we do have in, uh, indices including like uh, coronavirus and all for different uh, countries so now it is loading let's let me go back okay so now here we have indices it works the same you can type here any index or let's say i want to know the cds of a particular country let's say india so uh, what we can do is you can of course type here cds india so it will give you all the series uh, here as uh, well as you can select just say country India, like different parameters. Uh, so I want to know all the indices which are there for India, let's say. So uh, just click on get values. So these are all the indices which are there, including like uh, CDS, derivative market and all. So just click on that particular index, it will open a page where in you will see all the uh, CDS graph for, you can of course change it to one year, five year, 10 year. So we also provide so the, the source of this data. You can see it in the table form, export it to Excel. Again, as we check the code, you can put the different uh, date range and export it to excel as well uh, then again the tool which i mentioned that is excel add-in so you have to just download the excel add-in tool use different uh, formulas which we have in place trading floor you can uh, using that you can download the all the information on bonds which are there in your watch list get financial reports if uh, the issue information, so you have to just put the ISIN and you will get uh, all this information as well. So this, I would like to give you an individual presentation. So you can contact me for the presentation. I will be more than happy to plan an individual session with you and show you all the formulas, how it works. Uh, of course, I'll go through all the tools which we have. Uh, then. API, so there are some companies who are interested in the API feeds, so uh, which can be done. So we have different parameters here as well. Uh, so you 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 just use, uh, we have our own forms and everything. Uh, we have a separate team which handles API. So so if you are interested in API as well, please feel free to, to contact me. Uh, and uh, we'll arrange uh, uh, it for you. And also I wanted to mention is we'll be having some special prizes for all the participants of this uh, seminar. So uh, feel free to contact me. I, I hope this session was, was uh, very, uh, very uh, useful to you and you got all the information from different speakers and everyone. Uh, for all the questions you have on the platform, I would be happy to answer now. So, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, share on my email ID or, or you can type them now. And um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so we have a question. Yes, this session is being recorded and... Uh, uh, we will have uh, we will have everything all the information on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So uh, 
you will get all the information so i guess there are some participants who who joined in late yes this this session is being recorded and we will have it in uh, on our uh, youtube channel yes okay thank you uh, everyone so feel free to contact me for a trial access or if you have any questions regarding platform thank you very much have a nice day thank you